Welcome to POTUS ABC Kids, hosted by my dad, Professor POTUS. POTUS ABC Kids is a fun place to learn and play. And now, here's your host, Professor POTUS. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to POTUS ABC Kids, a fun place to learn and play. Hello, parents, teachers, homeschoolers, and kids. This is Professor POTUS, and it's a delight to be coming to you again. If you're new to us, POTUS ABC Kids is an educational initiative designed to teach your children the ABCs of American history. And we do that through storytelling about our 45 presidents. And when the kids learn about presidents, they learn about American history. Now, sadly, educational statistics have been showing that only about 18% of high school students are graduating and testing proficient in American history. Uh, that's alarming. Uh, historian David McCullough points out that we're really on the verge of having a historically illiterate society here in America, probably for those, say, 35 years or younger. So POTUS ABC Kids uh, hopes to sort of bridge that educational gap here, and we use media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and uh, YouTube. If you would like to see some of our longer form videos, you can subscribe to us on YouTube at POTUS ABC Kids, or you can always hashtag Professor POTUS. So the Revolutionary War takes place from 1775 to about 1781. It takes a couple years for the Treaty of Paris to be ratified and brought back over here. That's 1783. And then we, uh, we pass this new document called the Articles of Confederation to govern the new nation, the 13 colonies. Well, after a few years, it was abundantly clear that this document, the Articles of Confederation, were not working very well. There was no power to, uh, to, to uh, tax for revenue. Uh, all individual 13 colonies had their own money, their own currency. Uh, there was uh, really no presidency or executive. It was just a one branch of government, a, a Congress or a parliament. So James Madison and others came up with the idea of gathering uh, representatives from all the 13 colonies on May of 1787 to, to uh, either amend the articles but what Madison wanted to do was really come up with a, an entirely new document to scrap the Articles of Confederation and just start from scratch. And sometimes in life, that's what we have to do. Now, it was very hot there in Constitutional Hall, and I encourage you, if you ever come to Pennsylvania or Philadelphia, take a tour of Constitutional Hall, and you can stand there and see the very room that these delegates uh, deliberated for hours and had uh, fierce arguments and debates, just like they do today. Uh, and, but they finally came up in September with something they could live with. It was, there was a great compromise uh, in there. And uh, the, I mean, the institution of slavery was something that existed. Many of our founders wanted to do away with slavery, but those delegates in the South uh, did not. They wanted to preserve the, uh, the institution of slavery as abhorrent as it was. And so a compromise had to be reached in order to start our nation off with at least a, a governing document of the Constitution. Now, what's so brilliant about the Constitution is down a little further down after uh, Articles 1, 2, and 3, which sets up the legislative, executive, and judicial, Article 5 is this thing called the amendment process, and that was brilliant. And if it wasn't for Article 5, the fact that we could amend this Constitution, um, we would not have been able to get rid of the institution of slavery. And that happened with the 13th Amendment which was passed shortly after Lincoln's death, and it totally abolished slavery. So it's interesting how the Bill of Rights is something that, that uh, guarantees our, our freedoms. It's not really a permission slip by the government. So we're going to talk about that. So next week, or actually starting tomorrow Monday, we're going to kick off with these one-minute, 59-second videos that we'll do two or three a day to sort of take you through that process that happened in May through September in Philadelphia of how the Constitution got created. Now, when it when all the dust was settled, Benjamin Franklin walks out and a lady asks him, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government did we have? By the way, these meetings were secret. That's what they agreed on. The meetings were secret. They even closed the shutters, which made it even more hot because they wanted to have uh, these meetings in total secrecy. But once uh, the 37 signed, uh, Franklin comes out, Dr. Franklin, he's 81 at the time. He's in a cane and he's kind of having to be helped by some of his assistants. And a lady says, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government do you have? And he says, we have a republic if you can keep it. And so the Constitution at that time wasn't the law of the land. It had to go before all 13 colonies. And the rules were two-thirds of the colonies had to give it a thumbs up in order for the Constitution to become the governing law of the land. So, hey, kids, here's the math. So what's two-thirds of 13? 
Nine, right? So nine. So nine states had to ratify. Delaware was first to ratify the Constitution. And then New Hampshire, uh, in a, a year later, in 1788, became the ninth state, and the Constitution becomes the law of the land. In 1789, George Washington takes the oath of office as the first president on Federal Hall in New York City, there on the balcony. And he goes back in and delivers an address, and they have a little inaugural party that night. George Washington was a very good dancer, by the way. You see, these are kind of some of the things we talk about on POTUS ABC Kids. And then there was something that James Madison promised, because some of our founding fathers didn't like the Constitution. They thought it gave uh, it centralized government too much, and it would trample upon the 13 states. So all these things had to be worked out in a compromise. But James Madison promised that if you don't oppose the Constitution, you pass this document. Uh, when he gets to Congress as a member uh, of the House of Representatives in uh, Virginia, that he would introduce something called the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights basically started out as 19 points or 19 amendments. It was dwindled down to 12 and then eventually 10. And um, Madison kept his promise and the Bill of Rights was tacked on to the bottom of the Constitution in the year uh, 1791. This is a basic, uh, something we use as a teaching tool for the United States Constitution. And um, you can see that the Constitution doesn't begin with the words, we the government, <laughs> like in many nations. It begins the words with we the people. And that was something that was insisted upon by James Wilson. Now he was from Pennsylvania. He was probably the, one, of the, one of the most brilliant legal minds at the time. He spoke on the floor of the Constitution more than any other delegate. And he uh, single-handedly sort of crafted Article II, which set up the executive. Now, as the founders were crafting the Constitution during those summer months, uh, right behind them was the tall uh, 6'2 uh, general, George Washington. He was there. He was the presiding officer over the Constitutional Convention. Now, unlike our president today, Washington was not chatty. He was very quiet. He zipped it. He didn't say hardly anything. In fact, he really spoke not at all. Uh, and then uh, once the deliberations were over, he um, uh, signed the Constitution along with 36 other men. Now, Washington's presence there gave the Constitutional Convention credibility. Uh, this was a new nation that was struggling, and, uh, but Washington's presence uh, was important. And of course, he would become the first president because as they were crafting the Constitution, they were looking up at George Washington, kind of thinking that he's probably going to be our first leader. Now. Uh, after we talk about the Constitution the following week, I'm going to go down and talk about the Bill of Rights. And again, these are going to be one-minute video clips. I'm going to take your kids, or you as parents, this is a good refresher course for parents, by the way, homeschoolers. I'm going to take um, everybody through the first 10 amendments, okay? Uh, one through 10. And we're going to do them in one-minute video clips. And I like to keep it short and pithy. Remember, it was Shakespeare who said brevity is the soul of wit. The First Amendment, of course, is really the most important because it has five parts. Do you know what those five parts are? Well, we're going to review this because it's important to remember our history and to really know what is governing our nation uh, at this time, especially during a pandemic and a, a health crisis or a war. It's important that we don't let go of the Constitution during, during these uh, difficult times. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's very easy for government at times to overreach. What we have to remind people is the Bill of Rights is not a permission slip for we the people. It's kind of a restraining order on the federal government. The Constitution, specifically the Bill of Rights, puts the shackles on the government. We the people are free to live as uh, we please. We are a, a self-governing kind of nation and we must uh, remember that those who govern um, only uh, have the right to govern but for the consent of the people. And all these things are in our founding documents. So the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, what is that? It's freedom of religion. Uh, Congress should make no law, uh, no, church, no separation of church and state. Uh, you don't see that. Even today, you see states and uh, uh, countries around the world that have no separation of church and state. The, the dominant religion runs the government. They're entangled together. And that doesn't work out very well. Uh, Madison and Jefferson had it right that church and state would be separate. Uh, Madison and Patrick Henry argued for many hours about this when during the Constitution. Patrick Henry, by the way, give me liberty or give me death. He opposed the Constitution because he was kind of a radical, kind of a rebel, and he thought that it gave uh, too much centralized power uh, to the federal government. At the, I was going to say Washington, D.C., but the, the federal government started out in New York and then it went to Philadelphia and finally it came to Washington. But he thought it gave it too much power. So Madison and um, Patrick Henry had these great debates about the role of religion in America. And, and Patrick Henry's idea was that the government 
revenues would go to support ministers and churches. Madison said no. And uh, Henry says, well, why not? You're a Christian. James Madison was a Christian man. His dad was a reverend, the Reverend James Madison. In fact, Madison and Virginia, most, most of these type intellectual men who were, who were well-educated and had the means to do so, they would go to the College of William and Mary. But the Reverend James Madison, Madison's dad, had a different idea. He sent his son up to the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton, because he wanted him to be mentored by the, the great Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon, a man uh, who was very wise with great intellect. Uh, he was a signer both of the Constitution and the Declaration. So Madison was a very Christian person, but he disagreed with Patrick Henry on the role of government and religion. And uh, uh, Henry says, well, don't you want Christianity to thrive in America? And James Madison said, yes, but Christianity and religion will thrive better if it's left on its own. And I'm glad James Madison won the day. And Article 1 talks about religion. It says the government cannot prohibit the free exercise thereof, I would submit to you that even in a health crisis, the government has no constitutional authority to tell churches they cannot meet and congregate and worship, okay? But it also said that the government uh, will not be entangled in the church and the church will not be entangled in the government. Good stuff. Uh, also, free speech is so important. That might be something that you don't like. I might say something right now that offends you. I'm sorry. I have the right to speak freely, and that's so important. And then uh, the right of the press, the media, to, uh, at that time it was just basically newspapers and pamphlets. And then of course the right to assemble and the right to uh, protest against uh, grievances against the government. So these are five fundamental parts to the First Amendment. The Second Amendment, of course, the right to keep and bear arms. The Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy. Uh, the Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendments right here in the courthouse, uh, those are the right to a fair trial. I'm going to put some duct tape on my mouth next week and sort of demonstrate that the Fifth Amendment doesn't um, require you as an American citizen to speak at all. You can, you can, you don't have to incriminate yourself. Uh, you, 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 uh, you have the right to remain silent. Okay, and so that's the brilliance of the Fifth Amendment. That's not the case in a lot of nations around the world. Uh, and so the Sixth Amendment is the right to a trial, and of course the Seventh Amendment is the right to a trial by jury, by a jury of your peers. Okay. And then, of course, the Eighth Amendment says uh, the government can't issue cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, and then the Ninth Amendment basically uh, says, you know, if it's not in the Bill of Rights, it doesn't mean that it's not available. In other words, let freedom ring. And then the Tenth Amendment says that anything that's not reserved to the federal government or prohibited to the states is left to the states. So that's basically the states' rights clause. So we're going to talk about all that next week. I hope you'll join us on POTUS ABC Kids. Thanks for your time this morning. Have a great weekend and uh, be safe out there. And join us next time on POTUS ABC Kid. Thank you for listening to POTUS ABC Kids with my dad, Professor POTUS. Please visit our really neat Facebook and Instagram page at POTUS ABC Kids. Until next time, listen to your teacher, be kind to your classmates, and God bless America.